All right, so today the topic is all about dysbiosis in the upper GI tract, which turns out to actually be potentially very important when it comes to overall health. Uh, so, of course, when we're thinking about dysbiosis, that's a fairly broad term, and it's helpful to kind of think of a definition as we get started. Um, so basically, dysbiosis very broadly refers to imbalances in the microbiome that are associated with negative health impacts. Now, the key there, though, is where are we looking at in terms of the microbiome and what imbalances are we talking about? Um, so this second bullet point is really important because most of what we know about dysbiosis, uh, especially in the gastrointestinal tract, uh, comes from the, the sites that are most easily accessed or accessible for testing. Of course, that's basically stool samples by and large, as well as oral sampling for the oral microbiome. But the big question there is, what about the rest of the gastrointestinal tract? What do we know about the microbiome in those areas? And is it important when the microbiome in those areas is out of balance? Uh, so there's a lot of brand new research that's been coming out, especially even in the last year, that started to yield some pretty interesting insights and suggest actually that dysbiosis in the upper GI tract not only is relatively common, uh, but may have some pretty big implications overall for health. And again, a lot of that new information has come from research that's just come out recently, as well as advanced testing, gastrointestinal testing, that's become available over the last couple of years that involves very precise identification of organisms in the gut, as well as their quantitation. Uh, so this has really all kind of come together uh, to help provide some really interesting clinical insights into upper GI dysbiosis. Uh, so these are the topics that we're going to be going through today um, in relation to uh, the importance overall of upper GI dysbiosis. So we're going to start off and talk a little bit about the health implications kind of in a broad sense and give you kind of a sense of what we're learning about that. Then we're going to dive into some details about the upper GI microbiome and kind of get you familiar with how the upper GI microbiome differs from what we know, especially about the microbiome in the colon. Uh, then we're going to talk about what happens when there are imbalances in the microbiome uh, regarding upper GI dysbiosis, and then how do we assess those imbalances through testing, and as well as go through a couple clinical examples illustrating uh, some typical test results that we're seeing with this new advanced testing. And then lastly, just want to kind of touch briefly on general uh, approaches for addressing upper GI dysbiosis uh, based on what we're learning from those imbalances. So just as a quick reminder, uh, when we're talking about the upper GI tract, technically that can include everything from the mouth down to the lower GI tract. Uh, but really what we're going to be focusing on in this uh, webinar is the stomach and, and upper small intestine, and in particular duodenum, which tends to be kind of a hot spot for what we're learning about dysbiosis and its effects. And of course, that happens to be the same location where digestion absorption start to occur. Uh, so that's a really kind of interesting clue as to why it may be so important overall for health. So let's talk a little bit about upper GI dysbiosis and in particular some of the health implications uh, that basically may be implied from some of these imbalances. So of course, as you can imagine, when there's upper GI dysbiosis and if that affects the function of the small intestine, that can certainly uh, lead to nutrient deficiencies as well as a wide range of gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, so a lot of the typical symptoms such as gas, bloating, diarrhea or constipation, abdominal pain, et cetera, that we typically associate with IBS and or SIBO uh, may be due to this upper GI dysbiosis. And there's some intriguing new information and new research that suggests um, that basically these imbalances, whether or not they really constitute SIBO, may play a big role in gastrointestinal symptoms. And that would also include increased risk for various types of food sensitivities, and we will be addressing that as well. Uh, in addition, this upper GI uh, dysbiosis, in terms of what we're learning from research, uh, also seems to increase susceptibility to certain gut pathogens. And in turn, gut pathogens can cause or exacerbate upper GI dysbiosis. So it's kind of this two-way interaction. Some of the consequences locally in the gut include chronic inflammation, increased intestinal permeability, i.e. leaky gut, 
and then leakage of LPS from gram-negative bacteria across that leaky gut, uh, which can contribute to what's called endotoxemia, i.e. LPS that gets into the bloodstream. And then there's also an increased chance for uh, exacerbating histamine intolerance, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, and then basically another thing that we're learning from this scenario is that GI infections, especially the interaction with the normal upper GI microbiome that leads to dysbiosis, can also then downstream lead to chronic gastrointestinal diseases as well as potentially systemic diseases and symptoms. So this is an example of a recent research paper uh, that was just published this year, so I've emphasized that at the top. Here is published in May. Uh, in this article, which is titled Small Intestinal Microbial Dysbiosis Underlies Symptoms Associated with Functional Gastrointestinal Disorders, we show that SIBO, based on duodenal aspirate culture, which is considered the gold standard for assessing SIBO, reflects an overgrowth of anaerobes, but does not correspond with patient symptoms and may be a result of dietary preferences. Small intestinal microbial composition, on the other hand, is significantly altered in symptomatic patients and does not correspond with aspirate culture results. So this is a bit of a controversial result because, of course, there's a lot of emphasis on SIBO uh, in terms of testing, diagnosis, as, as well as some research. Uh, but this uh, research study is actually calling some of that into question. And now that we have these techniques for looking at the composition of the microbiome in the small intestine, uh, it's a little bit more nuanced uh, than necessarily just uh, referring to um, the overall situation as potential SIBO. Uh, so we'll get into that as well. Uh, they go on to say the duodenal microbiome significantly distinguishes healthy and symptomatic individuals. Pairwise tests, FDR, et cetera. So they basically did a statistical test. Uh, it was definitely statistically significant. Uh, but does not distinguish presence or absence of SIBO among healthy or symptomatic individuals. In summary, our findings highlight the potential clinical benefit of characterizing the small intestinal microbiome. Uh, so these sorts of symptoms are, of course, quite common, the typical symptoms we associate with SIBO and IBS. And it turns out if we're able to get additional information about the specific composition of the microbes in the small intestine, that could provide some detailed information that may allow us to target uh, our approaches more effectively. And of course, that's a big issue with SIBO because so many patients uh, do not respond well to SIBO treatment or they tend to relapse. I just wanna highlight this one briefly just by the title here. Uh, so this one says the duodenal microbiota composition of adult celiac disease patients is associated with the clinical manifestations of the disease. And again, we'll get into this a little bit more later in the presentation, but this is hinting at the fact that the composition of the microbiome and variations of it uh, that constitute dysbiosis actually influence the clinical manifestation of celiac disease. Um, they've actually identified now certain microorganisms that may play a significant role. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what's known about the upper GI microbiome. Uh, we're going to talk about two different aspects. The first is involving the upper GI microbiome and that it's substantially different from that from the lower GI tract. So that's one of the ways in which we potentially can distinguish some of the microbes that are detected, for example, in stool samples. Uh, it appears, based on what we know from research, that some of them may actually be coming from the upper GI tract. Uh, so stool uh, tends to be kind of this mix of mostly local bacteria in the colon, but also some uh, bacteria and other microbes coming from higher up in the GI tract. Uh, the second point is that nutrient sources and physiological factors largely determine which species tend to thrive in different locations along the GI tract. And this is a really important point to understand because it allows us to understand some of these underlying factors that cause or contribute to dysbiosis, some of which we can potentially address. Uh, so this is just basically, uh, I'm going to be presenting some uh, figures from different studies illustrating what's known about the difference between the upper GI uh, microbiome and the microbiome in the large intestine. Uh, so these sorts of differences ha actually have been shown to be pretty consistent, kind of in a broad way, uh, in different animal models as well as in humans. So the first study here is bacterial community mapping of the mouse gastrointestinal tract. The next one is characterization 
of bacterial microbiota composition along the intestinal tract in pigs. And then the last one is analysis of transcriptionally active bacteria throughout the gastrointestinal tract of healthy individuals, i.e. in people. Uh, so we're going to look at three different examples here and see that there is pretty strong consistency in especially the differences between large and small intestine or large intestine and upper GI tract. Uh, so this is the first figure from the mouse study, and this is showing composition at different sites in the upper GI tract. You can see at the bottom, uh, in terms of the x-axis, that the sites are stomach, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Uh, and then they show a key at the right in terms of which fam which <clears throat> excuse me, bacterial families are involved. Um, and in general, you can see that they're fa fairly um, consistent from compartment to compartment. And then I'll show by contrast, these are the results for the large intestine. And so you can see in this uh, figure that the x-axis shows cecum, colon, and feces. And I'll just go back to the previous slide. So you see there's a lot of consistency in the upper GI tract, and it contrasts pretty significantly with what we see in the lower GI tract. So let's go ahead and move on to the next study. Um, so this is basically a figure from the study uh, that was done in pigs. Uh, that happen to have a pretty similar GI tract to humans. So that's why they're actually studied in terms of GI function. Uh, again, because there's a lot of similarities between the anatomy and function of their GI tract and ours. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so you can see at the bottom here that uh, along the x-axis, uh, we see the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Uh, so that's representing, especially the duodenum and jejunum, more the upper GI tract. Ileum is kind of at the junction, especially at the terminal ileum. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but then there's a big transition to what we see uh, in the colon. So they have um, information for the proximal colon as well as the distal colon. So you can see that, the, for example, the Bacteroidetes phylum, uh, which is here shown on the right, uh, that's in the red color, dominates uh, in the colon. Uh, Firmicutes are still present in the colon, uh, but then there are other groups uh, present as well some of which were not, not present in significant levels in the small intestine. <clears throat> All right, so this is the next figure, and this is from that last of the three studies, and this is the um, study from humans. And the thing that was different about this study is the previous studies looked at uh, DNA isolated from stool, so it's looking at DNA from the microbes. And we do know that DNA tends to reflect what's going on locally, but because uh, microorganisms may not be necessarily growing in that particular gastrointestinal section, or some of them may actually have already died, we can still pick up the DNA and detect them. Uh, so it's a little bit unclear sometimes exactly where the microbes are coming from with DNA tests, uh, DNA tests unless we have information from research on where they typically thrive. Uh, but this is done with an RNA-based test. Uh, the technology is called metatranscriptomics. And so they're looking at what's basically the metabolically active bacteria in these different sections. Uh, so looking along the x-axis, uh, basically I'll go through here. And the first one is saliva. Uh, the next two are from the stomach, so from the corpus and the antrum. Then the dx and tix are small intestine, so d is duodenum. ti is terminal ileum, uh, which is uh, essentially that part right next to the cecum. Uh, then basically for the large intestine, we have the ascending colon and the descending colon, and then lastly, fecal sample. So once again, with the human samples, you can see that there's a pretty significant difference between the upper GI and the lower GI, and yet within those areas, it's fairly consistent. Uh, so of course, the big question is, why are there such big differences between those compartments, and what does that tell us? So let's look at a little bit uh, more at the kind of summary that's come out of these studies in terms of the types of organisms uh, that are seen in the upper GI microbiome. Uh, so in terms of composition, the bacilli class, which is a major group within the Firmicutes phylum, tends to be pretty dominant in the upper GI microbiome. Uh, different studies vary somewhat, um, certainly from organism to organism. There'll be some differences in species, et cetera, but largely the bacilli class as a whole tends to be very well represented in the upper GI. That includes organisms like Streptococcus, Lactobacillus, Enterococcus, Bacillus, and Staphylococcus. Uh, many of these are often included in various uh, GI tests. Uh, 
Um, the key thing here, though, and we'll get to this in a moment, is that uh, they all tend to thrive in higher oxygen environments as well as simple nutrients, which is the type of conditions that uh, prevail, particularly in the upper small intestine. We also see a pretty high prevalence of the proteobacteria phylum, which is normally thought to be, if it's too high, thought to be indicative of dysbiosis. Um, although normally in a normal uh, upper GI tract, especially again in the small intestine, proteobacteria tend to be pretty elevated just normally. Um, they can be even uh, elevated at an even higher level in certain types of dysbiosis, but it's much more common to see them at high levels in the small intestine, and that's considered fairly normal. Once again, because many of the bacteria, or most of the bacteria in the proteobacteria phylum, tend to thrive in higher oxygen environments and also thrive on simple nutrients. So by contrast, just kind of at a high level, the composition of the lower GI microbiome is largely uh, consisting of the Clostridia class, which is a different class from the Bacilli class. Both are in the Firmicutes phylum. And then the Bacteroidetes group within the Bact or the Bacteroides group within the Bacteroidetes phylum also tends to be pretty dominant. Uh, of course, there are many other groups and species, but these tend to be among the most dominant ones. They tend to thrive by contrast in anaerobic environments, and they subsist typically by and large on complex fibers. Uh, so a big difference, and you can start to get an idea of the differences in physiology and nutrient availability that drives these differences along the GI tract. Uh, so this brings us back to uh, the two points that we're covering now. Uh, so we've talked about this first one, the upper GI microbiome, and that it's substantially different from the lower GI tract. Uh, but then we want to address the second point here, which is that uh, nutrient sources and physiological factors largely determine which species tend to thrive in different locations. Uh, so basically, this is just a short list of some of the key factors that are known to influence the microbiome and which types of microbes can thrive in different parts of the GI tract. Uh, so the first four I've put in bold because lots of studies tend to indicate they tend to be among the most um, uh, potent in terms of shaping what types of microbes can thrive in different areas. So that includes diet and particularly which types of nutrients are available in that uh, particular part of the GI tract. Oxygen levels, which tend to generally decrease uh, as you go along the GI tract, but it's going to vary a little bit, and we'll go through that in a moment. Uh, pH, which of course varies throughout the GI tract, especially with regard to the stomach, where pH of course is very low. Uh, flow rate, of course, is very different along the GI tract as well. It tends to be much higher in the small intestine and much slower in the colon, and some uh, estimates are that it's roughly, on average, about tenfold uh, lower. Then, of course, there's immune factors, uh, as well as digestive secretions and other aspects of the digestive tract, such as motility. Uh, and then, of course, we have the nervous system component in the gut as well that controls secretion and motility. Uh, but then there's also exposure to other things, uh, which is a long list but includes uh, various drugs. And again, that list is growing too through new research, various chemicals, etc. So lots of different factors can affect the types of microbes that can thrive in a particular part of the GI tract. Uh, so this figure is from a recent review article, and it kind of somewhat simplistically summarizes the trend through the GI tract in several key com uh, uh, parameters or components. Uh, so kind of at the bottom here, you'll see a schematic of the small intestine, and then that connects into the large intestine. So starting with the ileum, then the cecum, then the colon. And then looking at the top, we can see that generally the bacterial load increases pretty dramatically as we get into the colon. Uh, and that's many orders of magnitude in terms of the concentration of microbes. That's pretty significant, and that speaks to uh, partly the motility differences, uh, but also other factors. Bile acids are an important determinant of uh, which microbes can grow in a certain area. Uh, bile acids tend to be present, uh, of course, in the small intestine, and then largely, at least in a healthy GI tract, they're reabsorbed in the terminal ileum. Uh, so generally, bile acids are much lower in a healthy individual in the colon. As I mentioned, oxygen levels tend to decrease. Uh, pH sort of very generally tends to decrease as well, uh, mostly in terms of just contrasting the stomach and the duodenum with uh, the rest of the GI tract. 
Um, and of course, simple nutrients are mostly available in the small intestine before they're absorbed. And then basically those are depleted by the time the uh, digesta gets into the colon. Uh, and then basically these undigested foods and especially fibers tend to be the predominant forms that are available. This is another figure from a recent review paper, um, and it kind of gives us a quick visual way to look at one of the key differences uh, between the upper GI compartments and the colon. Uh, so I won't go through everything here, but basically starting at the top is the oral cavity on down to the colon. Uh, but you can see here they've noted a few of the key physiological factors that are different on how they compare from compartment to compartment. One of the things that's basically uh, consistent in the upper GI is that basically everything says either variably aerobic or partially aerobic. Uh, so that gives you a clue that many of these different types of microbes that predominate in the upper GI tract tend to be at least tolerant to oxygen and actually in many cases use oxygen for their respiration. Uh, I've noted those with the red dot. Uh, but all of a sudden in the colon it's a, it's a much uh, different environment, in fact dramatically different uh, where it's highly anaerobic. Uh, so you can see the big difference here, and that's one of the key factors that helps determine that sort of stark difference between upper GI and lower GI. Uh, so this is a little bit more of a nuanced um, representation of pH in the GI tract. Uh, again, this is a figure from the uh, paper that's referenced here, microbial ecology along the gastrointestinal tract. So looking through the GI tract, mostly we'll be focusing again on the stomach and duodenum and just kind of comparing that in light of what we know about the large intestine. But of course in the stomach, we know the pH generally is low, of course unless patients are on PPIs or have hypochlorhydria for other reasons. Uh, and the duodenum also tends to be fairly acidic uh, until uh, it reaches a point of uh, where there's the release of bicarbonate that helps to neutralize that. So then the rest of the small intestine tends to be neutral or close to neutral. Uh, but then there's a sudden transition from the small intestine into the colon. And the first part of the colon, of course, is the cecum, uh, which has a relatively acidic pH, not nearly as acidic as the stomach, uh, but certainly much lower than the small intestine. Uh, so that's thought to be one of the key factors for this abrupt change between the small intestine and the colon. And then the remainder of the colon tends to have um, a more neutral pH, somewhat lower than the neutral. Uh, and it's going to basically uh, increase as you go throughout the colon. So the, the ascending colon tends to be a bit more on the acidic side, uh, whereas the descending colon tends to be more towards the neutral side. So as you can imagine, there's all these different physiological factors that need to come into play to determine uh, a healthy microbiome and also function, of course, in a different uh, part of the GI tract. And of course, the flow generally, of course, is from top to bottom. So as you can imagine, um, a good analogy is sort of the domino effect, that if something goes wrong in the upper GI, uh, or even higher, um, then that basically can cause this domino effect potentially that uh, causes disruption in the microbiome and therefore can interfere with GI function. Uh, so this is an example of one of the factors that's now pretty well established uh, in terms of altering pH in the stomach and also uh, the duodenum. So this is titled Intestinal Dysbiosis Secondary to Proton Pump Inhibitor Use. And in the article they say, gut dysbiosis associated with the use of proton pump inhibitors has been found to lead to occurrence of infectious and inflammatory adverse events. Then they go on to say, PPI use significantly increased the presence of streptococcacea and enterococcacea, which are risk factors for C. diff infection, and decreased that of fecalibacterium a commensal anti-inflammatory microorganism. And Fecalibacterium is now regarded widely as a keystone species that produces butyrate, tends to be low in a wide range of chronic diseases, uh, and is considered uh, to be something that's needed for a healthy microbiome. Uh, so this is actually a pattern that we tend to see pretty frequently with gut testing, where we're able to actually detect potentially uh, certainly the microorganisms in the colon, such as Fecalibacterium, but also pick up organisms that may be coming from higher up in the GI tract, such as streptococcus and enterococcus. Uh, we do actually see those pretty frequently in patients, for example, that have been on PPIs. Uh, this next title uh, discusses, or article discusses the role of H. pylori in also contributing to hyperchlorhydria. So the title here is Helicobacter pylori induced changes 
in gastric acid secretion and upper gastrointestinal disease. Most patients chronically infected with H. pylori manifest a pangastritis with hyperchlorhydria. Reduced acid secretion is mainly due to functional inhibition of parietal cell secretion by the products of the bacterium and or the inflammatory infiltrator, i.e. the inflammatory response to H. pylori. Progression to chronic hypochlorhydria may be entirely or partly reversible with eradication of the organism. Uh, so it turns out clinically we do see this pretty frequently that H. pylori seems to have a similar impact to proton pump inhibitors in terms of the patterns that we see on gastrointestinal testing. Uh, this next one is titled Crypt Hyperplastic Enteropathy in Distal Duodenum and H. pylori Infection. Reported two cases without evidence of celiac disease. H. pylori is recognized as one of the most common bacterial infections worldwide and is associated with significant upper GI tract pathology, mainly gastric-related, but also in the duodenum. Uh, so that's an important point to consider is, of course, uh, the stomach and the duodenum in some ways are physiologically similar, but then there's a very significant difference in that in the duodenum is when digestion really starts to begin, especially in terms of the brush border enzymes. And so as you can imagine, based on this research, chronic low-grade inflammation seems to be uh, almost a given with chronic H. pylori infection, along with hypochlorhydria. So in theory, and this is something we actually see borne out clinically, uh, that there can be a pretty significant impact on digestion. Uh, they go on to say duodenal mucosal inflammation with increased densities of intraepithelial lymphocytes, which is a type of inflammatory cell, is well described in helicobacter pylori infection. In fact, the inflammation is similar to that of early developing celiac disease, uh, so which is a really interesting um, finding that there's a little bit of overlap in terms of the underlying pathology uh, from H. pylori infection and also celiac disease. Uh, so as you can imagine that um, maldigestion, malabsorption can also be a consequence potentially of H. pylori infection. Uh, this is a, a basically a table, a figure from a recent review article on celiac disease, summarizing all the other known causes or many of the other known causes of small intestinal villus atrophy. And so basically that's when there's significant inflammation and potential damage done uh, through gluten exposure in those who are susceptible to celiac disease. Um, in this case, there's many other things that potentially can cause similar pathology. Uh, and this is, again, just a partial list. And you can see here um, in that first column on the left, there are various immune disorders, of course, celiac disease itself, uh, as well as a few others, including inflammatory bowel disease. And then infections in particular tend to be a potential cause of similar pathology, including H. pylori, which is listed here, uh, but also Giardia, Cryptosporidia, and then viral gastroenteritis, which would include norovirus and also rot rotavirus. Uh, so lots of different potential enteric pathogens may cause this type of uh, small intestinal damage that then, of course, can impact digestion. Um, of course, that can lead to nutritional deficiencies, but also nutritional deficiencies in turn can actually uh, feed back and contribute to uh, this damage or dysfunction in the small intestine. Uh, then on the right, they list many others, including various medications, uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, uh, NSAIDs, which are uh, really common. Uh, some research, which I'm not going to show here, uh, suggests that the combination of NSAIDs with PPIs can cause even more damage in the small intestine. Uh, and of course, many, many people are on both of those. So the question is, 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 so we know that this all has some pretty significant implications, uh, potentially in terms of health, um, but basically what we really want to know is this something that we can actually detect with stool testing, since that's the most common type of uh, GI testing that's currently done. Uh, so this article uh, begins to address uh, this particular uh, scenario. So this is uh, one that we talked about earlier. Um, so I'm going to show this figure again in a moment, uh, but the title again is Analysis of Transcriptionally Active Bacteria Throughout the Gastrointestinal Tract of Healthy Individuals. So again, they're looking at active bacteria using an RNA approach, uh, so that helps us understand which ones are actually thriving in a different compartment, and that can give us some really good information. They go on to say that the predominant genera in the upper GI tract uh, 
include, uh, I won't go through the whole list here, uh, some of them you'll recognize. We've talked about Streptococcus, uh, Pseudomonas as well. Uh, were almost absent from the lower GI tract. H. pylori constituted approximately 8 to 99 percent, uh, so obviously it can uh, basically just completely dominate uh, the stomach, um, and then 42 to 97 percent of the total gastric bacterial community in the antrum and corpus, respectively. Uh, so H. pylori can be a pretty significant factor in the stomach and uh, also in the duodenum. They go on to say that in addition, Metabolically active H. pylori was observed at lower abundance in the duodenum, but was virtually absent in biopsies from the low, lower GI tract and in fecal samples. The absence of 16S rRNA of H. pylori in the lower GI tract and in feces shows that H. pylori is not an active member of the microbiota in the lower digestive tract. This does not contradict the fact that H. pylori, DNA, and antigens can be detected routinely in feces. So this is really the critical thing. And H. pylori is kind of the case in point um, that indicates that we can detect some of the organisms coming from higher up in the GI tract that are not actually active in the colon uh, by picking up the DNA. Of course, if you do an RNA-based study, you may not see H. pylori and you'll miss it. Uh, but that's one of the advantages of DNA testing is that we potentially can get some insights into what's going on higher up in the GI tract. Uh, so again, really, really interesting study. Uh, again, showing pretty clearly that H. pylori is very active in the stomach and to some extent duodenum, uh, but not active in the colon. And so again, this is showing that figure uh, that basically shows us that there is this abrupt uh, kind of cutoff between the upper GI. Again, uh, on the left of the x-axis, we have saliva, the corpus and antrum of the stomach, the duodenum, and then we go to the ter terminal ileum and then into the colon, and then a fecal uh, sample as well. And again, there's this abrupt difference, and this, again, is looking at the active microbes. So many of the microbes that are present in the upper GI tract that we actually can detect in stool uh, based on DNA tests are not active in the colon. All right, so let's jump into a quick case illustrating some of what we talked about so far. Uh, so this case involves a 51-year-old female, and just a really quick summary here, not getting into the details of the case, uh, but basically the main issue is uh, treatment-resistant SIBO, and this is constipation-dominant SIBO, uh, where she has already been treated with antibiotics as well as antimicrobials, and symptoms still persist. <clears throat> uh, so the first page of this test, and this is the GI MAP test, uh, shows that the, no pathogens were detected, um, on the second page at the top, we see that parasitic uh, pathogens are also absent, viral pathogens not detected, but we do see a high level of H. pylori is detected in this case, along with a couple of the virulence factors. And we know just from research that, in general, uh, the more virulence factors that are present, the higher the risk is for the more significant outcomes of H. pylori infection. Uh, but in general, even at kind of at the basic level, in terms of what we know about impacts of H. pylori, it tends to cause low-grade inflammation as well as hypochlorohydria. And then, of course, that can lead to uh, some downstream com consequences. So now we're looking at the normal bacterial flora section. Uh, basically, there's a couple things out of balance here. You'll see I've highlighted one of them, Fecalibacterium prasnitzi, because that was mentioned in one of the research articles we went over, uh, that basically low stomach acid, H. pylori, can have a negative impact on this important butyrate-producing bacteria, and in fact, we do see that in this case. Uh, the marker right above it, acromantia, is generally considered beneficial. Uh, when it's overgrown, there are some health implications potentially, but by and large, clinically, when we see it elevated, it tends to be part of a pattern that reflects reduced digestion or some sort of digestive impact, uh, so it's something we commonly see elevated when H. pylori is present. Uh, then on to the next page, which is the opportunistic bacteria section. Uh, we do see that there are a couple that are considered high in this patient, Bacillus and Streptococcus. As a reminder, Streptococcus is one of the groups that's commonly found to be elevated in patients that are either on PPIs, and also several studies have shown that it's elevated in patients that are positive for H. pylori. Uh, so a number of different lines of evidence suggest that elevated Streptococcus tends to be related to, it, to hyperchlorhydria, and possibly more generally reduce digestion. I'm going to go through the rest here. So uh, nothing was elevated under the autoimmune trigger section. 
Uh, under the fungi and yeast section, we see that candida uh, was actually found to be high in this case. Candida species in general uh, and also candida albicans uh, was detected as well. Uh, when we do detect them on GI map, they tend to be something that's more often to be clinically significant. And in general, we also tend to see it only in the context of a general digestive dysfunction type of dysbiosis pattern, and frequently is something that we see along with H. pylori. Uh, so there's some really interesting sort of relationships between candida and H. pylori, uh, but again, we tend to see it as part of this pattern, most commonly clinically. Um, no parasites were detected in this particular case, uh, but we do see in the intestinal health section, under that first section uh, for digestion, that not only steatocrit is elevated, and that's a measure of fat malabsorption, but also elastase is uh, significantly reduced, which is confirming that there is some sort of dysfunction uh, related to digestion, and in this case, um, this confirms it's involving at least the pancreas. Uh, the presence of H. pylori also suggests that hypochlorhydria is also likely part of the, the overall picture. Uh, we can see under immune response that secretory IgA is very low. This is often a consequence of reduced beneficial bacteria, especially butyrate-producing bacteria. And we saw that uh, one of the more important butyrate producers, Fecalibacterium, in the normal bacterial flora section was in fact below detection limit. So that's another uh, potential link uh, that we see here in terms of the intestinal health markers and the dysbiosis uh, in the microbiome. So I want to show you quickly another case uh, involving kind of a similar pattern, but a different presentation. Uh, so this is a 33-year-old female with long-term recurrent acne, and that's her main complaint. Uh, she's had numerous rounds of antibiotics to address the acne, and it does temporarily help, uh, but then essentially the acne comes back. Uh, so we don't see any pathogens. Uh, we do see that H. pylori, once again, is positive, and this is quite a high level. Uh, we see that there are some imbalances in normal bacterial flora <clears throat> with high levels of clostridium and high levels of acromantia, uh, which we see commonly clinically associated with a general uh, digestive dysfunction pattern, often uh, including presence of H. pylori. And then looking at the phyla microbiota section, we can see that both phyla are low, which suggests that there's a kind of a broad deficiency in beneficial bacteria. Then under the opportunistic bacteria section, we see quite a bit of overgrowth. Many of these different types are elevated. Uh, so again, this is a pattern that we commonly see associated with H. pylori and then other scenarios also involving uh, various forms of digestive dysfunction. In this case, candida was detected. It's not especially high, but it was present. And again, typically this is something we see along with this pattern and may be clinically significant. Uh, we do see that a parasite was detected here, not an especially high level, more moderate. Uh, that's another uh, factor that we often see as part of this digestive dysfunction H. pylori pattern. Not entirely clear why, uh, but it is something we commonly see. Um, it may be contributing to symptoms as well, or it may be the entire picture of dysbiosis plus potential digestive dysfunction that's leading to symptoms. And then if you look at the intestinal health markers, uh, steatocrit looks good, so fat malabsorption does not appear to be an issue. Elastase is a little bit lower than optimal. Optimal is, uh, on our test is roughly considered to be around 500 and above. Uh, so that suggests there may be some uh, kind of moderate decrease in pancreatic output. Immune responses, we can see that secretory IgA is low once again, and that often, again, is a consequence of low beneficial bacteria. Uh, the standout feature here is zonulin is elevated, so that's confirming that uh, high levels of intestinal permeability are part of the picture here. Uh, so it's a little bit different from the last scenario, although we still see that overall pattern. In this case, the pattern was a bit stronger. H. pylori was higher. We saw uh, a more overgrowth in uh, opportunistic bacteria, et cetera. So it's possible that that's leading to higher levels of intestinal permeability. And that scenario in general, leaky gut, uh, of course, has been tied to a wide range of symptoms and conditions, even systemically. Uh, so once again, kind of to bring it back to what we see clinically, uh, we often do see that skin issues tend to be linked or associated with the presence of H. pylori, and that may be due to some of these downstream consequences affecting digestion and often leading to increased intestinal permeability.
Uh, so this is going back to the opportunistic bacteria section for this patient. And I've highlighted Pseudomonas because there can be some additional implications when Pseudomonas, uh, either the uh, genus level or the species Pseudomonas aeruginosa, is overgrown. Uh, so that's addressed by this particular uh, really interesting um, research study that was published uh, earlier this year. You can see at the top the date is um, March 2019. Uh, so in this article they say opportunistic pathogens, including members of proteobacteria such as Pseudomonas aeruginosa, isolated from the duodenum of celiac disease patients, can metabolize gluten pre-digested by human proteases into shorter immunogenic peptides that permeate uh, better through the barrier and stimulate human gluten-specific T cells. So essentially what's happening here is the presence of pseudomonas is it basically secretes a protease or produces a protease that can further break down gluten, uh, but it only breaks it down to the point where it's more easily able to cross the intestinal barrier, and then basically those fragments do stimulate the immune system, uh, in particular T cells, and then can exacerbate symptoms in celiac disease patients. Uh, now we do know that Pseudomonas and Pseudomonas aeruginosa are actually very common in, in healthy and uh, patients with symptoms. Uh, so it is a common organism. It's not something that's just isolated in celiac disease patients. And so it may also be a basis for gluten sensitivity in non-celiac type uh, patients. Uh, so they go on to say here we found a correlation between Pseudomonas relative abundance and increased proteolytic activity against gluten in the small intestine of patients with celiac disease. Uh, and basically their conclusion is thus correction of bacterial proteolytic imbalance in the small intestine may constitute a new therapeutic target to prevent or ameliorate food sensitivities triggered by specific protein antigens. Uh, so this is something that we're finding out more and more from research that uh, the presence of the microbiome, especially in the small intestine, and in particular the duodenum, that many of those microbes do produce various types of proteases that can affect whether or not an antigen is going to cause an immune response. So it has a, the microbiome in the small intestine has a big influence on whether or not patients may develop reactions to foods, i.e. food sensitivities. Uh, so this is a related study. Uh, the title here is Duodenal Bacteria from Patients with Celiac Disease and Healthy Subjects distinctly affect breakdown, gluten breakdown and immunogenicity. They say bacterial colonization produces distinct gluten degradation patterns in the small mouse intestine. Uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, an opportunistic pathogen from celiac disease patients, exhibited last day's activity and produced peptides that better translocated the mouse intestinal barrier. Um, and they go on to say that Pseudomonas aeruginosa modify gluten peptides activated T cells from celiac disease patients, so basically similar to what we saw in the previous study. In contrast, however, lactobacillus species from the duodenum of non-celiac controls actually degraded gluten peptides produced by uh, human proteases as well as uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa proteases and reduced their immunogenicity. So basically studies show that lactobacillus breaks it down further to the point where they're no longer stimulating the immune system. So as you can imagine, the balance between lactobacillus and pseudomonas, for example, in the upper GI will affect whether somebody is going to respond to gluten um, favorably, or I shouldn't say favorably, but basically not have um, the negative effects from gluten compared to patients uh, that may have an uh, overabundance of pseudomonas. Actually, it looks like I have this in here twice. There we go. Uh, so this is another interesting study on the effects of beneficial bacteria and how they can help reduce reactivity to gluten. Uh, so this uh, study, I'm just going to read the title here because it pretty much says um, the giveaway point here, which is a commensal bifidobacterium longum strain prevents gluten-related immunopathology in mice through expression of a protease inhibitor. Uh, so this is another way in which native beneficial bacteria and potentially probiotic bacteria can actually help uh, improve various health scenarios, and in this case, can help reduce uh, the um, immune responses to gluten by basically inhibiting the protease that's produced by certain species like Pseudomonas so that it doesn't cause that problem in the first place. So we see kind of two different mechanisms here. We saw the lactobacillus 
breaks the gluten down into small fragments that are no longer a problem for the immune system, whereas this particular strain of Bifidobacterium longum actually inhibits the protease enzyme produced by bacteria such as Pseudomonas that actually can break down gluten into the more um, immune-stimulating form. So really interesting uh, information here on additional actions of beneficial bacteria. Uh, so this next article is titled Mechanisms by Which Microorganisms Influence Food Sensitivities. So this is kind of getting at the broader concept here. And they say one mechanism through which bacteria could affect immune responses to dietary components is through bacterial metabolism of antigens. This aspect is of particular relevance in celiac disease in which proteolytic resistant gluten peptides or proteins are the undeniable trigger of T-cell mediated inflammation. Uh, so again, that's just sort of addressing the importance of the microbiome and influencing susceptibility to food sensitivities. Uh, here's another example here of the impact of Pseudomonas on certain disease conditions that may be related to what we just learned from these recent studies. Uh, so again, I'm just going to read the title here to get the point, which is Molecular Analysis of Fecal and Duodenal Samples Reveals Significantly Higher Prevalence and Numbers of Pseudomonas aeruginosa in Irritable Bowel uh, Syndrome. So it may be that uh, this, this action that Pseudomonas has in the duodenum, and I didn't get into the details of the one study, but they basically showed that the protease that it produces actually stimulates inflammation in the duodenum that then can, of course, affect the overall function of the small intestine. Uh, and that's also going to impact uh, the digestive enzymes, i.e. the brush border enzymes that are part of uh, the duodenum in particular. Uh, so that may be one way in which uh, Pseudomonas may contribute to IBS-type symptoms. Um, this is just a quick note that other organisms that we saw in the table that I showed earlier, uh, including Giardia, um, can certainly cause issues in the small intestine as well, and that's certainly known to be the main site of infection uh, for Giardia. And as you can guess by its actual name here, uh, Giardia duodenalis. Um, so they say findings available to date indicate that the infection causes diarrhea via a combination of intestinal malabsorption and hypersecretion. Malabsorption and maldigestion mainly result from a diffuse shortening of epithelial microvilli. Uh, pathophysiological activation of lymphocytes is secondary to GRD-induced disruption of epithelial-tight junctions, which in turn increases intestinal permeability. So again, it's this same sort of scenario where it can cause inflammation, it can cause disruption of the intestinal uh, barrier and the tight junctions leading to leaky gut, which then will allow antigens and LPS, et cetera, to get through, and then that can cause immune imbalances. Uh, so I just want to kind of zero in here for just a moment on brush border enzymes because uh, that's really a very important function of the duodenum in particular. Um, so there are many different enzymes that are part of the brush border, uh, including disaccharidases, and of course one of the best known is lactase. Uh, there's also diamine oxidase, or DAO, uh, which metabolizes histamine, breaks down histamine, uh, then there's something called intestinal alkaline phosphatase, which appears to be or turns out to be very important overall for a healthy intestinal uh, lining and also just overall for GI health. And then, of course, various proteases can be produced as well. So I'm just going to focus on a couple of quick examples here. Uh, this title here is Disaccharidase Deficiencies in Children with Chronic Abdominal Pain. Uh, they say carbohydrate intolerance or malabsorption has been suggested as a cause of chronic abdominal pain in a subset of patients. We aimed to evaluate disaccharidase deficiencies in children with functional chronic abdominal pain and to correlate deficiencies with clinical features. Uh, so to kind of cut to the chase, I won't go through all the details here, uh, but you can see in the results a uh, pretty large percentage of children uh, with chronic abdominal pain uh, had confirmed disaccharidase deficiencies, and so that's what basically what they conclude at the lower part of this uh, summary which says a large proportion of patients with chronic, chronic abdominal pain have deficiencies in disaccharidases. Uh, so if you kind of think back to that table that I showed with all these different factors, including uh, H. pylori, Giardia, various drugs, et cetera, nutrient deficiencies, all of those can affect the function of the small intestine, which then, of course, can impact the brush border enzymes in a negative way, then that's going to have downstream consequences that can lead to maldigestion and malabsorption. And then, of course, that can produce further symptoms. Uh, the other one I want to focus on here is something that's kind of only recently been recognized as something that's uh, 
really important to a balanced microbiome in the small intestine and also in the colon to some extent. And this is intestinal alkaline phosphatase. So basically it's produced by intestinal epithelial cells. Its main function or one of its main functions is to actually detoxify LPS as well as other inflammatory microbial products. It also has been shown to help manage the bacterial population and help basically counteract pathogens and opportunists and help promote beneficial bacteria. It's actually also known to regulate tight junctions, so it helps control leaky gut. And a deficiency has been implicated in inflammatory bowel disease and a growing list of other conditions and diseases as well. Uh, so I just want to read a little bit of an excerpt from a study here, or a review article here, titled Intestinal Alkaline Phosphatase is a Summary of Its Role in Clinical Disease. Over the past few years, there is increasing evidence implicating a novel role for intestinal alkaline phosphatase in mitigating inflammatory-mediated disorders. Loss of IAP expression or function is associated with increased intestinal inflammation, dysbiosis, bacterial translocation, and subsequently systemic inflammation. Uh, this is the really interesting part in terms of how potent it is. Uh, they say the toxicity of LPS resides in the lipid A part of the LPS molecule, which permits it to bind to its receptor. And that's basically LPS binding to its receptor, which is called TLR4, is what can initiate the inflammatory reaction. Uh, so basically, this IAP can remove one of the two phosphate groups on this lipid A part of LPS and reduce the toxicity or the inflammatory consequence of LPS by up to a hundredfold. So obviously it's really critical for helping to reduce reactivity to those uh, inflammatory bacteria or potentially inflammatory bacteria and to basically help make sure that there isn't going to be an excessive inflammatory response. So once again, in the small intestine, uh, when there's a disruption in function from various infections, from low-grade inflammation, et cetera, uh, from various drugs or a combination of those factors, that can affect the activity of this enzyme as well, and then that's going to be much less able to detoxify LPS, so it can sort of exacerbate that situation. Uh, so very, very important for the health of the small intestine. Uh, so lastly, I just kind of want to wrap up quickly just talking very generally about um, addressing upper GI dysbiosis, since, of course, we've talked most of the time about some of the implications and what's involved uh, certainly when there are confirmed opportunists or pathogens present on a test, um, essentially uh, that we know can disrupt the function of the upper GI tract and that may lead to dysbiosis, et cetera, especially if we see confirmation of that dysbiosis on a GI test, uh, then certainly addressing them can help to resolve symptoms because, again, it's think of that domino effect where uh, H. pylori tends to, of course, be an issue in the upper GI and the stomach, and that can lead to a cascade of issues downstream. Uh, so that's one way to think about, uh, when you think about sort of sequencing things clinically, addressing those types of organisms can be quite important for resolving symptoms and downstream issues. Uh, certainly as part of that overall picture, just supporting optimal digestion can be very helpful, uh, particularly in just helping to reduce symptoms. General mucosal support, leaky gut support would be very important as well, uh, of course, because there's generally a lot of um, dysfunction and damage that can happen with these various insults, including pathogens. Uh, so helping that um, mucosa to recover, uh, especially after an infection, can be quite important. And then, of course, the obvious, which is avoiding factors that are known to disrupt upper GI function, as well as the microbiome. And again, I refer back to that table that, that lists uh, many factors, not necessarily all the known factors, uh, but that's a great list to kind of refer to as a bit of a checklist, you know, which is the patient on a certain drug? Uh, have, have we detected a certain pathogen? Uh, do we know that there are certain nutrient deficiencies, et cetera? All of that can play into dysfunction in the upper GI tract and then have major implications. Uh, so I'd encourage you to check out the Diagnostic Solutions Lab website for additional resources. We do post a lot of materials uh, supporting interpretation of our tests, educational information on the microbiome and gut health, et cetera. Uh, so again, I would encourage you to check out the website for more information. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Fabian. Uh, we have time for just a few quick questions. Um, a couple questions came in early on. Our, our first question is, um, 
Will supplemental digestive enzymes show up as part of the elastase? No, uh, bacterial elastase and human elastase are structurally different. Um, they accomplish similar things in some ways as far as uh, the targets that they can digest, uh, but they are structurally different. So, uh, no, that would not be reflected uh, in the test that, that shows elastase uh, because that is targeting human elastase. Thank you. Our next question, um, someone's wondering how you feel about the research that states uh, H. Uh, pylori bacteria can provide a beneficial effect. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it is a bit controversial um, and there are lots of opinions out there and uh, lots of research that can help inform an answer to that question. So uh, it's likely that what, what we do know is that H. pylori can predispose to certain things like ulcers and uh, stomach cancer, for example, but it appears to be potentially protective against other things uh, such as esophageal cancer from, from what I understand. Um, so there may be a bit of a trade-off, but I think we have to look at the bigger picture, which is certainly with all these things that we know, uh, you know modern diets, drugs, et cetera, that can have a negative impact on the overall function of the GI tract, that's likely leading to an imbalance of H. pylori. So one of the kind of classic um, relationships in the stomach that we're starting to learn about is uh, native bacteria, normal bacteria in the stomach, and the stomach actually do does have its own microbiome, includes lactobacillus species. And lactobacillus species have been shown uh, to generally keep H. pylori in check. Uh, so you can imagine when there's an imbalance and there's fewer of the beneficial bacteria, that can allow H. pylori to overgrow. Uh, so there are many other factors as well, but most likely, from what we know, um, H. pylori at low levels may not be as much of an issue. Uh, it's most likely when it's out of balance and its uh, levels are excessive relative to the beneficial bacteria that would normally keep them in check. Thank you. And for our final question, um, someone is asking, should the general public avoid coconut oils and fats to reduce LPS? That's a good question. So I actually just looked at a study uh, when I was looking into the intestinal alkaline phosphatase that seems to address that. Uh, so we do know that uh, certain fats, especially certain saturated fats, do seem to increase uh, kind of the transport of LPS across the intestinal lining and can increase the amount of LPS in the blood. Uh, so that's fairly well established based on all the research that's out there. Uh, but it turns out that uh, a higher fat diet, um, they haven't necessarily looked at all different types of fats, uh, but in general, a higher fat diet um, can actually also increase intestinal alkaline phosphatase. Uh, so basically, it's a bit of a compensatory reaction where with higher fat, if you have an, a healthy intestinal lining to start off with, then that will upregulate and presumably take care of a lot of that LPS before it has an impact. Um, now, of course, then there's a scenario what happens when someone doesn't have a healthy intestinal lining. Um, that's where there may be additional trouble because they don't have enough of these protective factors like uh, intestinal alkaline phosphatase to help compensate for that. Uh, so I think, once again, it comes down to context. Um, but that's really the goal is to uh, ensure that there's a healthy intestine so that it's better able to handle these sorts of uh, diet fluctuations, et cetera. Um, one other note on that uh, question is in one study they showed that a high-fat diet in the context of um, not an excessive calorie intake uh, did not have that same uh, inflammatory effect as a high-fat diet in the context of excessive calorie intake. Uh, so Again, the total diet also comes into play and in whether or not uh, patients are consuming excessive calories or not. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Fabian, for uh, a great informative webinar. And thank you to all of our attendees for taking the time out of your busy day to join us. Uh, this webinar was brought to you by integrativepractitioner.com and sponsored by Diagnostic Solutions Laboratory. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day.